Um, we have been working through spiritual warfare uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, we started with uh, the maxims of war and uh, the three components that each strategist that I've read, tactician that I've read, um, these are what are necessary to be successful in battle. Uh, you need to know your enemy, you need to know yourself, and you need to know your battleground. And I want to pick up, we, we worked through know your enemy. And before I get into know yourself, I want you to know that I intentionally did not finish know your enemy. You mean there's no, more to know about the devil? No, there are more enemies than the devil. Um, <clears throat> When we talk about know yourself, there are two components that are vital to knowing. And it, it's really not who are you, it's whose are you. <laughs> to whom do you belong? Okay. Um, knowing yourself, identifying yourself, who, what is your identity, comes from whose you are, who you belong to. Okay? And there's only two options. There's only two. You are born into sin, completely separated from the God. So you belong to the God of this world. You go, oh, I don't serve him, I serve myself. Yeah, that's him. That's exactly what he wants. See, he doesn't care if you bow down and worship him overtly with full knowledge or with no knowledge at all. Because see, if you're bowing down to yourself, you're still bowing down to him. When you go through life, and, and Tim just really, he hit it on a couple of points throughout his thing. Without God in his life, there was a lot missing. There was a lot they weren't able to accomplish, they weren't able to do. There's a hole, a God-shaped hole. And we seek all of our lives trying to fill that hole with stuff, with things, with people, with relationships. You know, some people turn to alcohol, others turn to drugs, some turn to pornography, some invest in their family, some invest in their work, and they're seeking something to fill this hole, and nothing in this life can do it. God's designed us to be worshipers. He's called us to be worshipers in spirit and truth. But there's only one that is worth worshiping. And that's our Heavenly Father. He's the Creator. So I laugh when people tell me, oh, I'm an atheist, I don't believe this, I don't believe that. You know, I think faith is a crock. You know, you just put your faith in yourself. And that's a sad place for it to be. Because if you honestly look at yourself, look, look honestly, strip away all the facade, you'll see what a miserable wretch you are. So we're going to talk about whose are you? Whose am I? <clears throat> I want to start by how do you know whose you, you are, who you belong to, okay? Because there's a lot of people in church today that profess the name of Jesus Christ, that have no clue who he is. <coughs> and this is problematic in the church. It, it, it's a systemic virus that is rampant in the church in America today. We are so interested in numbers. We are so interested in, in the trappings of church that we've totally forgotten what church is to be about. We are the body of Christ. We are in moral opposition 
to the God of this world, to the culture of this world, and to everything that our flesh desires. I see so many churches in America today striving to reach out to the world. Now, I'm not talking about evangelizing. They want to compromise. They want to accept those things that the world has to offer and try and blend Christianity with other stuff. What does the light have to do with the darkness? You can't have both. You're either in the light or you're in the dark. That's, that's the only two options you have. Okay? So when you try and bring darkness into the church, one of two things is going to happen. The light is going to overwhelm the dark, or the light will depart and you will be in the dark. That's, that's your only choice. So in the church in America today, we have this idea, these people that are pushing forward to, we want to be open to anybody that would come in the door. We accept everybody. Yes and no. See, Christ is all about accepting people and then transforming them. So what goes out the door is not what came in the door. The only way you can come to Christ is through the cross. You've got to go up on the cross. You've got to die. You come to God holding something back for yourself. You haven't come to God at all. You can't have salvation and retain your own stuff. God, I'm willing to give you this, 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 and this, but this is mine. I will come to church when it's convenient. But it's my time, God. I will witness if they are a believer, if they really reassure me that they are a believer, so I'm talking to a brother or sister, I will live my life in such a way that there's no doubt I'm a Christian in church. But God, when I go out in the world, I gotta make a living. I got people that I got to deal with. I got to deal with unsaved people. Yes. As did he. See, what is the term Christian about? What does it mean? It, you know, it was invented as a, a, a term of derision. It was scornful. It means little Christ. It means imitators of Christ. And it was coined at Antioch when these, the Nazarene sect, oh, they're, they're all about that Christ guy. Well, those, you know what? You're just a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. That describes me perfectly. I'm a Christian. And what the world sought to mock, God said, you're, you're getting it. You're finally getting it. So, whose are you? How can you know that you belong to Him? How can you know? Now, Tim and I had a, a conversation a couple months ago, and we were talking about doubts. Anybody in here ever have doubts about your faith? Raise your hand. Okay, if you didn't put your hand up, you're a liar. And I'm going to pray God all over you. <laughs> okay. It is natural to have doubts because we serve an infinite God who has put into play an immensely intricate plan that is far beyond our finite, simple minds to comprehend. We've been going through questions in the brothers' meeting. And we, we pose a question and we take a week or so and we study it and we come back together. And some of the things we look at, we go, I don't know. It scares me when somebody has all the answers. It, it really does. Because if they figured out God, who are they really? Wow, 
Christ has come again. <laughs> if you are afraid to go to God with your questions, then you don't understand who God really is. Now, I'm not saying that we, we cast down the gauntlet before God, although you, there are guys in Scripture that did. Remember Moses? You know, with the two tablets? And it's taken Israel out of Egypt, and they keep going, oh, we want leeks and onions. What kind of sick people were they? <laughs> <laughs> That's just sick. We want gods that we can see. And Aaron, man, I'll tell you what. If one of my brothers pulled what Aaron did, I'd have dotted his eye. I don't know, I just throw gold in the fire and out come a cow. <laughs> You're an idiot. You think I'm going to believe that? <clears throat> God is frustrated. He tells Moses, and he talked with Moses in a way that just amazes me. I want to have that kind of relationship with God. He talked with Moses. He said, I'm killing them all. I'm going to take them all, except you. And from you, I will build a people. And Moses goes, well, God, <laughs> you can't do that. Oh, you, who's taking it to tell God he can't do that? <laughs> what was Moses' point? Because then all of these countries around will say you had the power to deliver them from Egypt, but you couldn't keep them in the desert. God, your name's at stake here. You can't do this. And God relented of his anger. Now, Scripture says he repented. God did not sin. Okay? What does repent mean? He turned away. He turned back. I'm not going to do this. Was God surprised? Was Moses such a spectacular orator that he convinced God to do something other than what God had planned? No. <clears throat> No, I think that story is in there for our benefit, for Moses' benefit, so that we can see how incredibly awful we can be before God, and yet He is gracious to us. So, how do you know whose you are? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to come to a clear understanding of where you start. You're a sinner. You're a reprobate. You are an enemy of God. You have set yourself in opposition to the sovereign creator of everything we know. Okay? That's where you start. Okay? If you have not come to God with that understanding, you're in trouble. Okay? Because God did not send Jesus in the world to save the healthy but to save the sick. So really, who did he send Jesus in the world to save? All of us. Every single one of us. Okay? So, we have to start from the foundation of understanding that God is absolutely perfect in his holiness. Okay? There is no one of us righteous before him. So we start there. If you would really go to God with an understanding of how you were before him, that's why nobody in Scripture could ever stand in the presence of God. Every single one of them fell down. Every single one of them fell down. Woe to me. I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I come from a people of unclean lips. So we start there. That's a desperate place to be. Okay. Now, people come to God in different events and different occasions and, and different things going on in their life. But the only way that you can receive salvation is to understand that you need to be saved. Okay. So, we understand God is perfect in His holiness. We cannot approach Him. Now, in the Old Testament, boy, that was tough. God laid down the law, literally. You want to see my holiness? You can't do any of this stuff. You know, according to the law, every one of you would have broken the law and you'd have to be sacrificing lambs right now. Every one of you is in wearing 
the articles of clothing with different material in it. <laughs> Every one of you. God put down the law for one purpose. To show us how very far removed from him we were and how very much in need of a savior we are. Okay? That's, that's why God put the law into place. And he, he did some stuff that I look at and I go, what, the, what does that have to do with holiness? Really? Tassels on the corner of your garments? Don't trim your beard? I'm hosed. <laughs> I'm a step ahead of some of you guys because some of you guys don't got beards. <laughs> so, God puts the law into place. He selects for himself a people. Why did God choose Israel? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs. Why did God choose them? Because they were weak. They were weak. God could have chosen any civilization he wanted. Sumer, Hittites, Egyptians. Didn't matter. He could have chosen any of them. But he chose them and he told them this. I'll tell you what. If God is not honest with you, you're not listening. Okay? God told them, I'm choosing you because you're weak. Because through you, I'm going to show my strength. Well, he went to Egypt. Egypt was already, man, their chariots are going here and there. And man, they, they're taking over swaths of land. They've got armies. and that. Oh, yeah, well, of course, they've got a mighty God. Look at the size of their empire. I don't know how they conquered anybody walking like this. <laughs> you ever tried to carry a shield like that? I can't even walk like it. But God chose Israel. And he said, from you, I am going to demonstrate my power. I am going to put into effect my plan to save the world. Okay? Now, what's amazing to me is how very arrogant Israel got about being chosen. Okay, why did he choose you? Because you're weak? <laughs> God chose me! <laughs> why? We don't talk about that. <laughs> I'm an inheritor of the law. We have the prophets. We are mighty. No, God is. And he had to keep showing them this over and over and over again. Okay? Now, really, is that any different than the church today? Don't we have the same arrogance? Don't, don't we have the same attitude toward the world? Aha! I'm a Christian. I am mighty. God chose you for the same reason. You're weak. Okay, you're, you're weak. That through you he might demonstrate his power. Okay? And if you come into it with the attitude that you have something to offer God, you're not useful. And if you come into it with the attitude that you have something to offer God, he's got to take that away from you so he can use you. What is the one thing that over and over in Scripture we see that God is offended at? Pride. 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 <laughs> Coming before him and saying, Yeah, God, I'm on your side now. Let's take this thing. <clears throat> Give your God flick you upside the head. Not pleasant. Okay? So we understand where we start. We understand that the only way we can come to Him is through the cross. You realize that when you come to the cross, all that you were before goes away. And you become a new creation. New. Something that was not before. Okay? When you come to him, he takes away all of the sin and the ugliness that you were, and he gives you his righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look there real quick. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to read this to you. Pick up in verse 17. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, 
If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You didn't know I was preaching scripture there, did you? All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, so what does being reconciled mean? Does anybody know what that definition means? Uh, being reconciled is simply to be restored to a right relationship. Now, what's amazing about this passage, and a lot of times we just kind of blink over this without understanding what's going on, okay? Because he says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Now, think about that for a minute. Who offended who? Who offended who? <clears throat> we offended him. We are the ones that offended him. God did nothing to offend us. Scripture tells us, if you go to put your sacrifice on the altar and you realize that your brother has something against you, lay it down, go and be reconciled to your brother. Go make things right. But God knew we could do nothing to make the relationship right. Why? Because there's none of us righteous. We're all sinners. How do we restore ourselves? How do we make ourselves not sinners? You can't. So God, through Christ, reconciled us to himself. But it doesn't stop there. Because he, he does something else. He says he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, what does that mean? What, what does it mean to have the ministry of reconciliation? Well, to minister to someone and to reconcile them. Okay? So your job, what he has given to you, to your task, Jesus made it very clear in Matthew 28. Go, and I, I hate the way that's translated, because the idea there is not get up and go. Okay? I'm going to go to the store. That's not what he's saying. The idea that is conveyed is as you go. Okay? So as you're doing life, Go into the world, so we are to go outside of these walls into the world that is hostile to us and hostile to God, and we're to preach the gospel, okay? Now, what does preach mean? Does that mean you've got to stand up here at front? Well, sometimes. But really, uh, preaching the gospel is simply telling others what the good news is. In order to tell others what the good news is, you've got to know what the good news is. Okay? You've you got to be able to share with them what God has done for you. So preach the gospel to every living creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And that's it, right? Because that's, that's where oftentimes we stop. When we finally get the guts to get someone to make a confession of faith, we, we end there. But that's not what Christ told us to do. What did he say after that? Teaching them. Teaching them what? To do everything I told you. See, Christ is looking for disciples, not converts. Man, we get an emotional moment and people will say anything. <laughs> oh, I love the Seahawks. <laughs> I'm so glad Ken was not here. Please do not tell him. <laughs> okay? But in an emotional moment, we respond to the emotion. Jesus did not tell us to make emotional converts. As a matter of fact, he tells people, consider the cost. What is the cost of coming to Christ? <clears throat> Death. You have got to lay down your life and your rights and your privileges, which are really a fallacy anyway, an illusion, to take up what he has to offer you. Teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. But then he gives us a promise. What does he say? I am with you always. Always, always, always. 
When things look bright and cheery, he's with you. When things look dismal, he's with you. When you don't have much of a feeling any which way how things are, he's with you. He has promised us this. Even to the end of the age. Okay, now, but one thing I left out right at the start, Jesus said something that kind of changes the whole dynamic of what's going on there. He says, for all authority has been given to me. And because all authority has been given to me, as you're going, preach. Okay, so let's get back here into 2 Corinthians. It says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ, God, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Okay, so we're going to come back to that in just a minute because I want to get this whole thought here. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Okay? There's a whole thing right here that talks about the Christian life. What it's all about. As you have received reconciliation, God has entrusted to you the task of carrying that same message to those who have not yet received it. Okay? We have to be firmly fixed in mind and purpose that our friends and family are dying and going to hell for eternity and we are not saying anything about it. Oh, we might offend them. Offend them for the love of God! Offend them! Can you really say that you love them when you know what their eternity is? Oh, God, put someone in their path. I did. You. Entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? It's someone that's sent out to speak the words of the king, or in our case, the president, on behalf of the nation. Okay? So when the ambassador speaks to whatever country, Swaziland. Whose voice is he speaking with? The, the President of the United States. He is his representative. Now, we have kind of lost a bit of how important this position is because if the ambassador doesn't know what to do, he picks up the phone. says, hey, I need to talk to Mr. President because they're asking me a question I don't know the answer to. But back before we had all the modern marvel of technology, the ambassador had the authority to speak on behalf of the president of his country. We are ambassadors entrusted with the authority and the message of our God to the world. Verse 21. This is really the core of what I want to get at. For our sake... He, being God, made him, being Christ, to be sin, who knew no sin. Okay? Now, we kind of pass over this because we don't understand the perfection of the Lamb. Because we never lived under the sacrificial code. We never lived under the law. We never understood that not just any sheep would do. It had to be perfect, without blemish. Okay? Perfect. You couldn't bring a blemished animal in and expect that God would honor your sacrifice. And God required of them perfection, but he also required it of himself, because he is perfect. So he sends the perfect lamb, had no sin to become our sin, and then look how it finishes. In exchange for that, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow, that is something that is absolutely astounding and amazing. You understand that if you have come to Christ Jesus, if you have given up your life, you have accepted His sacrifice on your behalf, you are perfect with the perfection of God. 
I still sin. It's covered. I'm going to sin tomorrow. Yep, it's covered. His blood has covered every sin. What about those that don't come? I mean, why do they need to come to God anyway? I mean, if their blood's, the blood's covered every sin, oh, well, he still told us to, we've got to come and accept. It's a gift. You can choose whether or not to accept the gift, can't you? I want it back. Where's my chapstick? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You had to choose to accept it. That's kind of gross, but you. <laughs> for example, for example. Okay. We have to choose whether or not to accept it. The thing that is amazing to me is how ignorant the church is about this whole principle. Okay. Because see, when we stand before God, we will stand completely stripped bare. All of our thoughts, all of our actions, what we did, what we said, will be revealed. All of it. Okay? And who of anyone that you know, up to and including yourself, can stand before God and claim to be perfect? None of us. Absolutely none of us. Isla, my little baby, grandbaby girl, could not stand at this point before God and be perfect. I don't know how that works. I know what scripture says. There is no one righteous. All have sinned. There's no wiggle room here, guys. So when we stand before him and all of that is revealed, and the accuser, remember we talked a couple weeks ago about the accuser, the devil who's going to point out in clear detail every sin that we've ever committed and, and how horrible we are. Thank God we have an intercessor. Somebody who stands on our behalf and says, no, I paid their price. Completely paid. Paid in full. Okay. But see, if you don't have that intercessor, if you've not allowed him to be your intercessor, you stand before God with the accuser as the only person on your side. And you turn and look at Jesus and he goes, I, I never knew you. I never knew you. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord. They're good. They're good. They know him. Oh, I, I read all about you in the book. I went to church here every Sunday. I did incredible things. I mean, you look at some of the things these people did. We would make those people leaders. Isn't that scary by God? Isn't that scary? And yet, when they stand before him, he's going to say, I didn't know you. You did not receive my blood. You had no relationship with me. I have nothing to offer on your behalf. Okay? So, whose are we? Now, I can look at fruit in your life. I can also be deceived. I, I love Scott Edmonds' poser. I love that illustration because it so accurately fits so many people. We can act the act. We can put on the facade. We can put on a mask and come to church. Okay? We can say the right words and do the right things. So you can fool me. I'm, I'm pretty easy to fool. But you could never... God. If you're unsure about your salvation today, if you're not sure, and you have honest questions, I want to encourage you. Read 1 John. The book of 1 John. 1 John was written so we would know whether or not we have salvation. Okay? So take a look at the things that are in the life of a believer. Okay? Hmm. This is my intro. <laughs> yeah, I'm still on my intro to the series. And this is my intro to this part of the intro. <laughs> Father, I ask right now that you would have each of us <coughs> carefully examine, carefully examine our lives, our relationship with you. Father, for those that know you and have relationship with you 
that have had their sins, their debt paid for. Father, I ask for a drawing closer, an increasing awareness of you, more complete obedience to the things that you would have. Father, more Christ-likeness. Father, for those that don't know you, I pray right now that your spirit would deeply convict, settle in their hearts a need for salvation, a need to be made right. Father, to be reconciled to you. To have the righteousness of God imputed to them, given to them. <clears throat> I ask God that you would make us bold in our proclamation of what you have done for us. God, that our hearts, our minds would be fixed on you. That, Father, we would scorn what the world would have to say about us, but press on, pressing in, desiring more and more your pleasure. Help us, Father, to be faithful stewards of all that you have given into our care. So that, Father, when your son returns, he would not find us wanting, but he would find his bride ready and waiting. I ask your blessing over this fellowship, Father. Strengthen us for the things to come. Help us to encourage one another, to be a support to one another, even to spur one another on to love and good works. Help us to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. And Father, where we go, help us always to speak your truth in love. We bless you today, Father. We thank you for meeting with us, for promising that we would go no place on this earth that you would not accompany us, that you would always be with us. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.